I take the first one. How about that? Let me uh, thank you all uh, for what has been, I think, an extraordinary two-day summit. The panelists, the speakers, the discussion have been focused. They have been, I think, illuminating. And they have been absolutely critical to an understanding not just of the present situation faced with respect to energy, risk, likely futures, but also options for dealing with what is a deeply, deeply concerning international situation, domestic situation for us, for key allies, not just in Europe, but around the world, uh, to how we go forward. Um, we are not at the institution or in the Center for Energy Studies or Baker Botts committed to admiring the problem. We're committed to looking at ways forward that make sense and that will achieve goals. But um, with our honored guest here, Secretary Baker, I want to turn the discussion to a specific topic which has been referenced throughout the last two days. And I'll, I'll start by noting a perhaps apocryphal but outstanding remark attributed to Prime Minister Harold McMillan. When asked by a journalist, it said, what throws off government plans, most critically? And he responded, events, dear boy, <laughs> events. Well, we're dealing with events right now that have a critical impact. And those events have come fast and furious over the past week to 10 days. The war in Ukraine continues, not just continues, but the doubling or tripling down by Putin in terms of references to the possibility of nuclear weapon use, the faux referenda conducted in the Crimea, in the southern provinces, in the east, the possibility of annexation of those territories to Russia, all of this and the explosions on the Nord Stream pipelines have added to the sense of perhaps desperation in Russia, but certainly concern on the part of the international market as to where this all is going. And so, Mr. Secretary, I place you in the, the crosshairs here. Where do you think this is all going? David, <clears throat> I don't know. <laughs> I don't think anybody really knows. I can give you, and I will, uh, a couple of thoughts that I have. But first, I want to welcome you here. Uh, we've got our, our second director since the, in the history of the Baker Institute, and we worked hard to recruit David. You're going to see, if you haven't already noted, he's going to be in a formidable director of this institute. We're really delighted to have him here. He's an outstanding diplomat and public servant. He's got a wonderful record. Uh, but more than that, he's a damn good fly fisherman. And <laughs> he's, he's gone up to my ranch a couple of times. Actually, the first time he went there was when I went up there as Secretary of State, and he was on my detail at the time. He's, he wipes the, the stream out. I don't ever want to follow him on my stream. Uh, I'm not being facetious when I say I don't, who knows how this is going to turn out. It's quite obvious, as you indicated in the question, David, that Putin has bitten, bitten off a lot more than he can chew, and surprisingly so. I mean, I, I remember when he first went in, uh, I wasn't at all sure that he would go in when, I, when all those troops were massing and everything. Uh, and, and then the, then the storyline became, how long is it going to take? Three or four days, a couple of weeks. You'll control the country. You'll put his puppet government in there. That's the playbook uh, that uh, Russia has been using. It's the playbook they used in Crimea. But I'm, you know, but we've all been pleasantly surprised uh, at, the, at the courage and the, and the stick to itiveness, if you want to call it that, the courage and the uh, ability of the Ukrainian uh, military forces and the weakness of the Russian military. 
Uh, he's now gone into this conscription, conscription uh, thing, and it's very unpopular in Russia. If you look at the, uh, if you look at your TV and read your newspapers, you can see where over 200,000 uh, uh, military age men in Russia have left the country. So there's a hell of a drain there. It's an unpopular thing. So far, the body bags haven't started coming back because they've, they've covered it up with the, their losses they've already uh, suffered in Ukraine. And when these conscripts get there, they're not particularly well trained. They have a, they're, being, they're being called up, and then they're being sent to the military and to the front in Ukraine with only two weeks of training, which is practically nothing. So I don't see how this is going to succeed. But I, my, my own view is we ought to be very careful in the West to conclude that the war is over and that Ukraine has won the war. There's still a ways to go. Putin is desperate. He's, con he's cornered. He's obviously concerned. You know, I, I think back with Putin to uh, sometime maybe 2002, 2003, the, uh, a helicopter landed on this open field right out here uh, north of the Institute, and Vladimir Putin got out, and President Bush and I, President Bush 41, and I greeted him. He came here to the Institute. We, he gave a speech over there in Studi Hall. It was a wonderful speech about cooperation between the rest uh, and, the, and, the, and Russia, the Russian Federation. That's all gone, of course, and we're now in this uh, massive Cold War once again. People say, how should we fight this Cold War? And my answer to that is take a, take a lesson, take a page out of the playbook of the last Cold War we had. That was fought pretty effectively, and, but we're right back there. And not only that, we're back there with China, we're back in a Cold War with China as well. So there are a lot of issues around that that are going to affect energy. Uh, but this has changed the, changed the chessboard. I don't know how it's going to end up. I don't think anybody could tell you definitively. I'm inclined to think at some point there'll be a, some sort of an agreed solution that would perhaps let Russia uh, save face by taking some parts of the Donbass. Uh, I think that that's not something we ought to support unless the Ukrainians come to us and say, this is what we want. And we ought to be steadfast in that and not let anybody think that we're going to support uh, a carving up of Ukraine. I remember being, uh, <laughs> being there at the, uh, present at the creation of Ukraine in 1991, and it was a very tense thing at that time. Ukraine wanted to declare independence. I was President 41, Secretary of State. We wanted to continue working with Gorbachev and Shevardnadze because we thought they were reformers, and history proved that they were. Uh, and so we didn't want uh, Ukraine to, to trigger internal conflict in the Soviet Union at that particular time, so we dissuaded. We were, we counseled caution and so forth. I was also there when we, when we convinced the Ukrainians to give up their nuclear weapons, uh, which in retrospect, you could argue with. At the time, I'm totally convinced that was the absolute right thing to do in terms of the proliferation of nuclear weapons. We didn't want to have 13 nuclear weapon states coming out of the breakup of the Soviet Union. And as you all know, uh, we, uh, we negotiated something called a Budapest Memorandum at that time, where we all, uh, the UK, the US, and the uh, Soviet Union all agreed that if, that if Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons, we would assure, not guarantee, but assure their security. And we, and we got commitments to that effect. Russia committed to that, that she wouldn't, that the, the four countries said, we won't attack you, we won't use nuclear weapons, and, but we won't guarantee 
your security. We will assure it. So the Budapest Memorandum, of course, is not, uh, Putin doesn't care anything about anything like that. And, and uh, here we are today. So how is it going to turn out? I cannot help but believe that at some point, it, uh, they'll get to some sort of a negotiated solution that might give Russia an off-ramp of some kind. But again, I would, I, I would counsel against our being letting anybody know that we favor that. I, I don't favor it. You're asking me where I think it might end up. That's where I think it might end up. Mr. Secretary, you've, you've dealt, as you referenced, with, with Putin uh, and his predecessors. If you were counseling the approach now to Vladimir Putin, specifically to Putin, what would it be? My approach today would be strength and resolve and determination. And I've been saying this now for about three or four years, maybe a little longer, uh, as you know, because you were living it. Uh, Russia has been out there buzzing our aircraft and buzzing our ships with their warplanes. And I've said for some time publicly, we should shoot one of those airplanes down. Russia is not a strong country. It's a weak country. It's got an economy that's half the size of California's or some percentage of size of California. And it's outrageous that we would sit back and let that happen with no consequences. So my, my view is dealing with Putin, he doesn't understand anything but strength, power, and resolve. I'm going to ask you a follow-up to that. In the previous discussion by the panel up here, a question was asked, if the war ends, will Europe go back to reliance on Russian energy? And the general judgment by the panel was not like it was in the past. No. What's your sense? Same thing. I don't think they'll go back to it, and maybe not even at all. <clears throat> I mean, they may, may continue to import some Russian energy, but they're not going to let themselves be dependent upon it. And that's the only policy uh, that they ought to follow. They've learned what the cost of being dependent on Russian energy now is. That's why I refer to, I don't want to get political here, but I will a little bit. <laughs> That's why I refer to our current energy policy, our domestic energy policy, as schizophrenic. I mean, how in the world can you be worried about the fact that the price of energy is going up and you want to increase production, but you go to Nicolas Maduro in Venezuela to, to increase the production? How stupid is that? And you keep your foot on the neck, you keep your foot on the neck of the domestic energy industry, which only two years ago brought the United States to a position of independence, to a position where we were net exporters of energy, which is a strong and important geopolitical strategic asset. So the policy today. I think, Mr. Secretary, the discussions of the past two days would bear out the, the schizophrenia that, that you point to. Yeah. But I have to ask the, the flip side of that yeah. question. Mm -hmm. If that's what is being advocated, how do you respond to the suggestion that this wipes out the possibility of energy transition? It doesn't just put it off. It eliminates it. Uh, How do you get to carbon neutral? All right. I don't, well, first of all, <laughs> I'm not a believer that we're going to get to carbon neutral in the lifetimes of anybody in this room. Because when the lights go out and the room gets cold, you're going to use fossil fuels. So the idea that you're going to abruptly cut off, uh, stop using fossil fuels is, a, is ridiculous. If you believe that, I got a bridge in Florida, I want to say, because that's not going to happen. Uh, but I do think that we could transition to renewable energy in a, in a much more gradual and, and thoughtful and less disruptive way. But the, these ideas, you said, po political leaders set a date and said, uh-huh, by this date, we're going to be uh, 
carbon neutral, and that, that doesn't work that way. So, uh, and, and furthermore, you got to tell the climate warriors, warriors, and by the way, I think the climate is changing, uh, and I do think that man has contributed some to it, I don't know how much, but you tell the climate warriors that uh, it's going to have to be a lot more gradual, that there can be a transition, there's nothing wrong with a transition, we ought to try and transition, but we ought to spend a lot of time trying to make sure that the major, that other, other major emitters are in there with us. Those other countries, I mean, India, China, Brazil, a lot of other countries, because whatever we do in this country is not going to get us to carbon neutral globally. It's a global problem, not a not a hemispheric problem. And on that subject of a global problem and China, that's our other big challenge. You identified yeah, a few minutes yeah, ago the, yeah. the Cold War yeah. with China as well. Where does that go? What's the best policy approach for the U.S. in dealing with China? Well, I, I, <laughs> I get back to what I said about the, a policy approach to dealing with Russia. Uh, when you're in a when you're in a war, whether it's a cold war or a hot war, you got to show strength and resolve and determination. I think we need to show that with China. I'm one. I'm guilty on this. I was Treasury Secretary at a time, then Secretary of State, when we thought uh, if we brought China into the community of nations, that it might change her behavior, her domestic behavior. We were wrong. It didn't. She took, she, we, I worked hard to get her in the WTO, and, uh, and we got her in, and, and, uh, and what did she do once we got her in? She started screwing or continued screwing every country in the world out there on trade issues and not living up to her commitments. That's not right. And so I think that we, uh, you know, fool me once, shame on me, fool me twice, no, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. That's where we are with China, and I think we ought to be, be resolute and uh, determined and strong. Do we exaggerate, do you think, the strength of Xi? Xi Jinping? The, yes. I don't, I don't really know the answer to that. It'd be interesting to see. Uh, one of those report, those in, intelligence reports that you and I used to read on that issue. <laughs> be, be interesting to see what our <laughs> intelligence community thinks. But I, I don't think so. I think the guy is pretty, he's pretty strong. You see the degree to which he's building up his military. He's, he feels free to uh, uh, flex his muscles in the Taiwan Strait. He feels free to bully all of his neighbors in the South China Sea. I think he's pretty pretty strong. Now, we've got a Politburo meeting coming up. I don't know, <laughs> when is it? Soon. Soon, and that may give us some clues. But I think he's a pretty strong leader, and he's accumulating more and more power unto himself. Not least, I would add, because of Putin's weakening position. Correct. I can't <laughs> help but believe that Xi Jinping thinks he made a bad deal in that, in that alliance he, he created with Russia just a few days, before, a few weeks before the invasion. Then the invasion comes and the Ukrainians showed, un, uh, uh, showed surprising strength and we are, in, we are where we are now. Xi Jinping must be thinking to himself, that wasn't a too good a deal I made. <laughs> exactly. Which is a good thing. And and another China question. You referenced the, the posturing, the swaggering um, in the Strait, in, yeah, yeah. in South China Sea, East right, Asia. Right. Do you think this is power projection of a rhetorical, optical character, or is there a genuine intent to move militarily in the against South China, Taiwan? Against, against Taiwan, Taiwan. I, I do not know the answer to that, and nobody knows it. I will say this. Again, I'm not being political. But I'm, it saddens me to see the President of the United States come out here and say, we're going to defend Taiwan if, if China invades. Oh, really? 
You know what that involves? How many, lar how many wars have we lost in the last 20 years across the Pacific, or 30 years, or what? Two or three. And we're going to go all the way. Uh, we're going to we're going to join a land war all the way across the Pacific. I think it's important that we make it clear we're going to defend Taiwan within all the uh, means provided for by the Taiwan Relations Act and give them all the defensive military equipment and everything else they need. But I don't think a president of the United States ought to leave a, a policy formulation that's, been, that's worked, uh, that, that policy formulation being one of a strategic ambiguity where we won't say what we'll do. We need to keep the Chinese thinking about it. And I, I of course, I, I think fighting another war all the way across the Pacific, I'm not up there now, but if I was up there, I'd be arguing against it. That doesn't mean you we don't defend them, the, the Taiwanese politically, economically, diplomatically, and every other way, and providing military equipment. But when you talk about we're going to defend them if they're invaded by China, uh -huh. that's a very difficult situation for us. Mr. Secretary, you, you referenced the success we enjoyed as a result of the outcome of the Cold War, the classic Cold War. Yeah. That success depended on national consensus, bipartisan consensus, right. and strategic patience. Right. Do you see those elements? present now, and, and if not, how, how do they come back? Huh. Well, that's how we cure, you're asking me how we cure the dysfunction in our politics in Washington, D.C. And if I knew that, I could make a lot of money. Uh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I really don't. I mean, it's going to take it's, we really need, it's one of the foremost problems facing our challenges facing our policymakers in Washington, our political dysfunction. The fact that we don't get the people's business done anymore. We send people up there and they have the luxury of not, having, not doing anything. You don't have to accomplish anything. All they got to do is show that they can fight the other side. Now, there are a lot of reasons for that. We don't need to spend time today talking about them. One of them, of course, is the rise of the internet, the fact that we're an evenly divided country, uh, the fact that people, the people we elect to Congress don't send their families up there anymore, so there's no socialization across party lines, uh, and, and the fact that the press are now players in our political debate. They, they don't want to see comity or agreement. They want to see uh, discord and divisiveness. So it's a real problem, and I don't know how we solve it. I am impressed, David, with the uh, unity that the country has shown around uh, aid to Ukraine. And I've said before, and I'll say again, I, I think that the administration has handled this Ukraine matter very adroitly and in very much the right way. I did a program with Secretary Blinken earlier this way up to February, I guess, in this year uh, when they were first confronting it. And I think they've done a darn good job of walking that line between helping Ukraine and, and, uh, and not so antagonizing or confronting Russia that we somehow get drawn into that conflict. We, that's another conflict we don't need to get drawn into. Very good. So, Mr. Secretary, you end on a bit of an optimistic note mm -hmm. with respect to the unity that the Ukraine situation has mobilized, mm -hmm. yeah. concerns over the ability to handle a complex long-term policy challenge such as the energy transition, yeah. or a potential for a continued conflict in Ukraine that right. doesn't go away in the near term. Yeah. And how do you respond to that? China, a strategy of deliberate, and there's precedent for this, ambiguity about use of force. Strategic ambiguity, Strategic on, ta ambiguity. on Taiwan. Well, on Taiwan, mm -hmm. but a position of engagement on the basis of firmness and strength. Right. As right. We, deal, we deal with Xi. With both of them, with both Russia and China. And, 
And I'm not suggesting necessarily strategic ambiguity in uh, you know, the Marshall Islands or some areas of the South China Sea if China begins to get really militaristic and expansionist there. And I noted with great uh, interest an article uh, or so yet, yesterday or the day before in the, in the journal, Wall Street Journal, saying that we're increasing our uh, consultation with some of the Solomon Islands mm -hmm. where we spent, where we, where we uh, sacrificed so many American lives during the Second World War. And Europe? and the U.S. transatlantic relationship. We come back now at the end to Isn't the bedrock of our policy. Isn't it interesting? Isn't it interesting to see Vladimir Putin unifying the North Atlantic Treaty Organization in a way that no Western leader ever could have? I mean, that is really interesting <laughs> and good, plenty good. I think it's extraordinary. Yeah. And I think it is the bedrock as it was, as it will be yeah, for, for I, U.S. strategy and security. I agree, David, and I know you do, having been ambassador to Turkey, and you know how important that alliance is. And, uh, and it's, been, it's been revitalized, it really has. And this has been a, a very good warning uh, shot to the Baltics, to Georgia, to uh, countries that are going to be next, that would be next on Putin's list. Uh, but I'm hopeful that he has overreached so far and that the, that the unity of the West's opposition has been such that this will give him problems internally. I hope it does. I'm not naive enough to think we're there yet, but I think we could be there. We, I think we could get there. And I hope that's what happens. I'm going to take one final opportunity to ask you on a different topic. Mm -hmm. What do you think about Iran? Iran? And the state of the U.S. relationship, the mm -hmm. JCPOA issue. Well, I think it was a mistake, and this is not a political statement, to ever get into the negotiation with Iran about their nuclear weapons and not include within that negotiation their support for terrorism in the region and worldwide. The behaviors. Yeah, yes, their behavior. Uh, but, but nevertheless, we are where we are. So I didn't, re I, I didn't uh, favor our unilaterally withdrawing. Mm -hmm. I think it was a mistake to get into that, uh, into that negotiation. I'm glad to see that it hadn't gone anywhere. Uh, I, th I think that by giving them all of them, by making a, a, uh, them able to achieve all this income that they achieved uh, as a consequence of, of negotiating that deal with them, we strengthen their ability to uh, engage in state-sponsored terrorism elsewhere. And I think that was sad and a mistake. So I hope, I hope the deal doesn't go any further. Now. That leads to the next question, which is a hell of a tough question. What do you do when they get the bomb? That's the question for you, David. <laughs> the answer to that is you have to continue to demonstrate the unacceptability of weaponization, much less the achievement of the bomb. I think the Iranian leadership at the highest levels knows that if weaponization were pursued, they would be found out. That there is no way they could conceal for long such a program. And that has to weigh heavily on their calculations. So you find it out, what do you do? You find it out, you provide a time-limited, sort of like Tariq Aziz in those last days and weeks in the Gulf be before War. the Gulf War began. Put a, put a timetable. You put a timetable up, you are explicit about what the consequences will be, which is you won't acquire the device. Mm -hmm. And then if you are challenged on it, you have to act. You have to pull the trigger right, if you yeah. show the gun. You never make a threat that you're not damn well ready to carry out. And that's what Obama made that mistake in drawing that red line 
in Syria, they're walking away from it. And see, that's why I have a problem with President Biden saying that we'll come to the defense of Taiwan, because that is an extraordinarily dip, that's gonna be a very difficult thing for us to do. We, you, don't, you don't take territory by bombing it. You gotta have boots on the ground, and that means all the way across the Pacific. So I agree with you, by the way, that, that it, if, they, if they weaponize, and I don't know how you prevent that, they're getting damn close to weaponizing. If they weaponize, you say, okay, you're gonna get rid of that by such and such a date. I'm not sure our intelligence is gonna be real good on whether they've gotten rid of it or not, but then you do what needs to be done. But that's an, that's a, that's a difficult undertaking as well. It is indeed. The world's <laughs> not a simple place, no. and, and not getting a simpler. Mr. Secretary, yeah. thank you. Thank you very David. much. Thank you. Thank you.